Welcome to Mind Body Monday and thank you all for joining me. In today's Mind Body Monday, we are going to be talking about Pesach and your gut, your digestive system. You're going to discover some tips and some strategies to help your digestion, to have more energy and boost your mood over this Pesach period. There's live Q&A and I'm going to share with you those strategies that patients have brought to my attention and things that I've tried in the clinic and patients have given feedback to say, yes, these were good strategies. So if you're watching the replay, please go ahead and type your comments or questions. That way you'll be able to grow the community and get some answers there as well. When you think about Pesach, you know, we think about matzah, we think about the Seder, we think about where all the wonderful things that come to mind, and a lot of people's minds also go to food. So Pesach, matzah balls, matzah barai, matzah crackers, matzah meal. So many of my patients tell me they love this Chag. They just struggle with the eating piece. They struggle with everything to do with the Seder, especially if you're overseas and you're having a two-day yontif that tends to compound things where there's heartburn, there's reflux, there's constipation, there's bloating, there's all sorts of discomfort going on. So this hug is a biggie for anybody who has a sensitive stomach or has a full-blown digestive issue like RBS or Crohn's or allergies or reflux or just a sensitive tummy. And I'm just curious if you're here in the live um, Mind Body Monday, go ahead and just type in the chat when you think about Pesach and your gut health, what concerns or challenges come to mind? What concerns or challenges do you, do you navigate or have to negotiate around Pesach time? Type that in the chat. Um, you can always PM me if you want or private message me in the chat as well. If you don't want to make it a public forum, I get that totally. Some of these issues can be a little bit personal. But go ahead, do that, type in the chat, and that way I'll be able to orientate this live session, a live Q&A, to your specific questions. So go ahead, type in the chat. When you think about Pesach and digestion, uh, what comes to mind, what challenges come to mind, or what, um, what difficulties do you encounter? So some people have written in to me privately here already. Thank you. Thank you very much. Someone's written in, in here, how to avoid eating all the matzah, the cake, matzah meal, etc. They give me a stomach ache, ache and digestive issues. Thank you so much. That's a really important question. Um, someone's typed in, taking time to eat healthily. Yes, Miriam, if that's a, a question or a comment, I'm not sure, but I'm going to hopefully deal with both angles of that. Someone else has written in, most of the foods we are allergic to are used in the substitution and what are we supposed to do? Good question. Good question. Someone else has written in, uh, we suffer from heartburn. Someone else, constipation. Someone else has written in, bloating. How do we deal with that? Great. All fantastic questions. So hang on, and I'm going to go through this um, Mind Body Monday and cover a lot of these pieces. So please feel free to continue to write in the chat any questions that you want me to come back to or jot them down for yourself and you can ask them in the live Q&A. Let me just begin with a, a, an overview of the way I like to organize this in my mind, the whole Pesach period, and how I, I teach my patients as well. Basically breaking down the whole Pesach period to four time zones and it's very organizing to recognize that there are four distinct time zones the first one is the period of time we in now that's before Pesach we in a week 10 days before Pesach so this is one time zone the second time zone is Erev Pesach the morning afternoon of Pesach itself specifically the morning time where you can eat Chometz, and then the third time is the post beer Chometz, where you've already um, burned your Chometz and can no longer eat Chometz, or even before that already. And then there's the Erev Yontif itself, there's the Yontif, there's Cholomoid. So there's 
there's four time zones. That's before Pesach, where we are now, up until the morning of Pesach. There's the Erev Pesach, where you can, bit, bit of the morning, you can eat chametz, and there's, there's beer chametz, where you can no longer, or Sreyfus chametz, where you can no longer eat. And then there's the Erev, the Yontif itself, how to manage the meal, the Seder meal itself, and then Cholomoyed. I'm going to, if you see these four time zones, there's four distinct, um, areas that planning, uh, that would benefit from planning, then it's very organizing, uh, for, for people. At least that, what, that will, I find myself in my, my practice as well. So let's just really begin with the area of the, the before Pesach. That's really from right now, when you're showing up in Mind Body Monday or you're watching the replay, it's from this period until before uh, the morning of Pesach, uh, of, of Passover itself. So I think there are some key strategies that will make it so much more helpful to you to negotiate this, air, this zone, this first time zone, when you have this in place. And I'm going to call it sort of boost, boosting our psychological resources this week. Because generally speaking, there is a lot that needs to be done. Whether, whether a person is great at executive functioning and making lists and organizing, and a lot of people just aren't. So some of these strategies will also speak to those people as well. So the first strategy to, to boost in your emotional resources, because it is really all about the preparation for Passover, for Pesach, is a preparation to our freedom. So we don't want to arrive at the Seder just burnt out and exhausted. We want to, this whole period is that preparation. And it's also a vote. It's also a vote of Hashem, everything you're doing. So the first is our bodies. Where Mind Body Monday is all about self-care being the heart of health care. So the first thing is our bodies making time to get adequate sleep. This is this first time zone. So we're from now until till the, the morning of, of, of Yontif, of Erev Yontif, is making, having a bedtime even, making, time, making sure you get your, your uh, earlier to bed or get more sleep. Hydrating your body is so, so important. And in this busy time, it's easy to skip meals or just grab things. It's not the time to do this. We are moving towards a very, very, very significant spiritual event and we'll, we want to come as prepared in mind, body, soul as possible. So this is the body piece I'm addressing now, is eating clean, hydrating, taking time to sit down and actually eat a meal. I was just speaking to a, a few patients today who said they went to Arshad, one of the local stores, and they left the house with not having gone to the bathroom and without hydrating properly and without some food, and the queues are, are big. So they landed up just you know, eating a bag of crisps in the, par- in the parking lot and finding a bathroom somewhere. And in other words, they, they were saying that had they been prepared and actually slowed down and think about it, did a check-in, that would have made the shopping so much more enjoyable because they would have been taken care of physiologically, hydrated and fed as well. And that makes uh, shop- the shopping experience so much more enjoyable. I want to look at a few strategies now to help boost our psychological resources as well in this pre, in this first time period. So the first is boosting our psychological resources by taking care of our body, because a rested body is often a rested mind as well. And we have more bandwidth to deal with the um, lack of order, the lack of Seder in this interim period. So the second strategy deals with self-acceptance, to really recognize that this is an interim period, there's a lot of changes, and that's part of what Chazal's intention was doing, was getting us unstuck. And if you come, if you're feeling overwhelmed or uptight or stressed or whatever it happens to be, don't judge yourself for it. It's really part of the territory. And in my groups, I say that naming is taming. If you can just Name the emotion or what you're feeling without any judgments. You're feeling stressed. You're feeling overwhelmed. You're feeling anxious. That's okay. Give it a name. It sets it outside of you. 
your take um, whatever self-regulation strategies you need um, to really give yourself permission just to feel those feelings without another layer of guilt on top of that because you shouldn't be having that. There's no place. Simply accept yourself, have compassion on your, on your situation right now, and move on with having given yourself permission to feel what it is you're feeling and own what you're feeling without any judgments. The third strategy, emotional strategy in this period of time, is really not to have unrealistic expectations. It's fantastic to have expectations. I'm going to get to a key teaching about that shortly. But not to have unrealistic expectations. There are so many images that come by our way on maybe the book, the cover of Haggadot, or uh, in our mind from, you know, magazines <laughs> about surrealistic uh, scenes and when we look at our life our life is so far there's such a big gap between our imagination of what other people are experiencing or what things should be ideally that we really set ourselves up for failure so it's so important to have realistic expectations and that means on a very practical level if the kids are you know going to bed late or they are you know, you haven't given them a healthy meal all day or they're just, you know, junking out on carbs and sugars. Let it go. It's not, it's just one day or one week in a year. It's okay. Nothing major is going to happen. And uh, it's important just to align yourself and allow all of these uh, uh, these un, unorganized, unreal things to happen because that's just part of this out of order order, if you know what I mean. And part of this um, unrealistic expectations is very often over this Pesach period, we get together with family, either nuclear family or cousins and whatnot, and then there's a blend of different people and around different meals, and very often um, it becomes, uh, relationships can become challenged in these intense situations where you around all a meal together or you're spending extended period of time over three or four days of Kulamod or a week together and that's all new and uh, there may be clash of personalities. Just recognize that this is also part of preparation, realizing that you're going to maybe in these scene situations, it's not going to last forever. You know, you'll put on your best, be yourself, healthy boundaries, and once again, realize in your mind it's not. It's only going to be for a few days and you can get back to a regular um, circle of, of people in your life that you uh, most resonate with. Um, so this is just a, a strategy regarding aligning our expectations, not letting them be unrealistic. The next strategy around psychological health is something that I practice pretty much every single day. And it's called Trade Expectations for Appreciation. What this means is expectations are all about looking forward to a situation to get something or hope for something. Or looking back to the past for what I could have had or should have had or did not have or did not get. So it's all about expectations either in the future or in the past. And what happens when we have expectations that are not aligned to reality? There is no room to be in the present moment. Right here, right now. And it prevents our ability just to tap into the beauty of this moment. And appreciation, on the other hand, when you trade your expectations for appreciation, Appreciation is all about right here and right now. And there is no room in appreciation for the past or the future unless one's reflecting. Because you can only appreciate really what you have right here, right now. You have food, you have clothing, you have a roof over your head, your home is warm, your clothes are comfortable, you have loved ones in your life, etc. So whenever you catch yourself comparing with other people, other people's situations, or you're finding yourself, you're having these expectations which will lead to disappointment. 
trade those expectations for appreciation and simply looking around and noticing what can I appreciate right here, right now, and staying open to see what is right here that will bring glow, bring glimmer, joy into your daily living. Okay, so that is really a little four or five strategies around this pre-Pesach time period. That's the physical strategies of looking after your physical being, the lifestyle choices, continue to exercise if you have already. It could be not necessarily the same uh, intensity, but making sure you go for your walk or or uh, you go to your gym class, whatever it is, that way you'll be at your best. And then hydrating, sleeping, clean eating, all the things we spoke about. And then there's um, the day of Pesach itself, Erev Pesach. Now, this time zone is important to, the, the key teaching here is to plan meals, especially for, uh, for yourself, for your kids, uh, for spouses, because Regarding kids, we all know that hungry, hungry, hungry kids and uh, husbands as well are generally cranky kids or husbands. So this is a time zone. Have in mind or, or just take a pen and paper, write down what are you going to feed them, you know, area of Pesach in the morning while Hametz is still permissible, where are you going to have that, and then what are you going to feed them in the afternoon. And the trick here is on the one hand, this is speaking to yourself as well, on the one hand, we want to come into the Seder, uh, and we invite it to do that, with an appetite. On the other hand, if the appetite is too big, then it'll land, we'll land up overeating, and that will cause a, a, a cascade of, of other challenges. So it's about getting that balance right. In terms of kids, well, it's so important we all you have to know your children and making sure that they're well fed in this period and slept as well as we're going to get to. And then there's the Yontav period, which is really the Seder itself. And I'd like to go into a little bit of a deeper dive in terms of some of those strategies for actual the Seder itself. So um, I'm going to, in a day or two, I'm going to send out a um, your Pesach Gut Health Guide. And uh, some of those strategies that are on that um, that um, gift are what I'm going to mention here today. So, in terms of the seder, because um, you know what, maybe what I'll do is I'll address one or two of the questions now and weave in those strategies um, as it relates to the seder. So, people have been WhatsApping me, SMSing me, and. Um, Sending me, an e sending me emails as well about the Seder, how to manage the Seder and all their digestive issues. So um, let me address some of these questions and I'll weave in some of the other strategies as well. So someone wrote in and said, I have, a, I have a sensitive stomach. What is the best matzah to eat? So firstly, the question is, I don't have a condition. I don't have IBS or celiacs or Crohn's or diverticulitis or whatever the gut it challenge is. I just have a sensitive tummy. What is the best matzah to eat? So it's a really good question, and there are a lot of, there's a lot of, you have to know your body and you have to know what works for you because there are higher fiber matzahs, and those will definitely work for some people, but higher fiber matzahs will irritate somebody else. So it's really important to know your body, listen to your body, and um, the bottom line is for everyone is whatever matzah you're going to use, it should be as thin as possible. I just went to a matzah bakery uh, last week, and I got two kinds of matzahs. One was what they call duck duck, which is very, very, very thin, and there's a surcharge for that because it takes more time to, to, to do. And also it has to be packed with much more care because it's much more fragile because you want whole matzahs as well. So those are very, very thin and it's much easier to, to chew, much easier to digest, and it's much easier on the digestive system. So that's the first thing to bear in mind is, is thin matzahs. And people ask me, are hand matzahs better than machine matzahs? Once again, there's personal preferences, and from a medical perspective, it's whatever works best for you. That being the case, that, that being the point, though, 
about what's the best matzah to eat, it's very important to bear in mind, and this is, here comes a, a, a Seder strategy for the Pesach Seder itself, is that you take your time to chew the matzah. There are lots of opinions of how much time you, you get to enjoy the matzah. Take the time you need to really use this as a mindfulness, meditation, eating experience, and whatever intentions one is having in one's mind is use this time. It's extremely, extremely potent in a spiritual opportunity, the time of eating. Chazal talk about, teach about the tikkun of the Cheta Adam Arishon, tikkun Achila, lots of incredible, beautiful teachings wrapped up in this first four minutes, first nine minutes, whatever it happens to be for you. Take that time, chew well, and, um, and, and enjoy that opportunity to take the most time that you need. The second um, strategy is what I do as well, and I mention this to my patients, is measure your matzah beforehand. I literally sit down with my kids, with bags, with everyone's names on it, and I measure the matzah, each amount of matzah per, per person's requirement. Last year we had some elderly folk at our table, and their matzah requirement was different. So this is why it's so important to check with your rabbi, to check with your poster to get the spec exactly right. So we measured out the matzah for each person, the maro for each person, the chorosis, whatever person needs, we got what they need for their digestive system, their age and stage in life. Um, and I'll get to the discussion in one in a minute. So those are some of the strategies going with thin, taking the time to eat, and the third one is measuring out. So you're not guessing and eating more than you need and then coming into some digestive distress as a result of that. Um, today I spoke with someone who's a celiac patient and um, they use a gluten-free uh, gluten free oat matzah and also a thin variety and that's what they use for their seder and they're very careful during the rest of Yontif not to have matzah because even that you know, the body accepts that too much could be problematic. Everybody's different. And working with your doctor, working with your rabbi is the way to go. And listening to your body, um, that way you'll be able to enjoy this hug in the best possible way without any downsides on any level. So, um, just a, a cautionary note on allergies. The, according to the USD, the US government, Something could be called uh, wheat-free or gluten-free if there's uh, 20 parts per million of gluten in a product. So from 20 parts uh, um, per, per million of gluten, that can be called gluten-free. But someone who's allergic has a zero tolerance. So it's really important to read the labels. This is a very important uh, concept, is to <laughs> read labels. I mean, just this week, um, this last Shabbos, I was away, and I made kiddush for my family on grape juice um, that the place provided. And it was so sweet. I was struck at how sweet it is. And during the meal, I was just looking at the grape juice bottle. It was 70% grape juice and 30% glucose corn syrup. I've never seen this before. And um, I took for granted, it said on the cover, you know, on the label, it was a nice uh, grape, uh, grape leaf and looked wholesome, looked natural, and they did their marketing advertising perfectly. But 70% was grape juice and 30% was glucose corn syrup. That means every three and a third bottle, they're actually getting for selling at a re significantly reduced, uh, well, at least the cost price is significantly reduced because glucose corn syrup is cheap relative to grape juice. So they're doing it purely for financial reasons and not really concerned about the health of their customers. So when it comes to wheat, it's so important to actually read labels and looking out for things like mat na alternative names for wheat at this period of time, which would be matzah meal, matzah balls, cake meal, farfall, egg matzah, things like that could indicate that there's wheat here, even though it may say it's wheat-free or, or gluten-free. So that's, a, that's very important to bear in mind. Okay. Um, so that was the Seder. Let's look at wine for a moment. Um, some of my patients complain 
of um, sulfite allergy. They have a sensitivity to sulfite. Sulfite is a preservative put in to stabilize the wine. So obviously the first thing is to use a sulfite-free wine wherever possible, and this is, uh, this is available. The second issue is, is alcohol. Al- wine is anywhere between 12 to 14.5% alcohol, and the sulfites plus the alcohol can really bother people. So I recommend to my patients to use, for those who, who, um, who can, you'll, they use a low alcohol sulfite free wine. So you'll probably find a low alcohol wine that's like anywhere between four and six and a half percent, but you, it's much harder to find a low alcohol sulfite free wine. So I have a strategy that actually I only learned about last week. I'm very excited about this. This is a sulfite filter. It is a product you can buy on Amazon. In fact, I will put it in the chat. Um, and if you're watching the replay, let me know and I can um, put it in the comments for you too as well. This is a sulfite, I put in the chat, a sulfite uh, wine filter that, that is and a phenomenal product that someone, I, I read some reviews about someone who used to get headaches and rashes and stomach problems with, uh, with, as a result of sulfites in wine. They used this filter and um, that solved their problem. I personally have not used this filter. I plan to look into it because uh, it's going to be much healthier to, to have wine sulfite free if you can't always buy wine sulfite free. So those are some strategies with respect to the wine is, is alcohol, lower alcohol or a sulfite free wine. And uh, regarding grape juice, if you're going to use grape juice, for those of my patients, there's not such a, there's not really a digestive uh, teaching here, but it's an important uh, piece to bear in mind that a lot of my patients I'm seeing uh, have, have type 2 diabetes and that's why they've come to me. So they have to regulate the glucose levels very closely. So having this amount of alcohol and this amount of white flour tends to bump up their glucose levels significantly. So one of the strategies, if you are going to use grape juice, so Certain grape juices can be diluted by a third in order, and still you can still use that for, for kiddish or for your four cups, but not all grape juices can be diluted. So check which, uh, which, um, grape juices are, can be diluted. I believe the Kedem grape juice, if you get the non-Kedem light, the Kedem light has already been diluted for you. Um, so they're diluted if, uh, with, with water, so it's it's less uh, it's less uh, fructose, less sugar in there. So that's um, those are some strategies around um, around wine. Okay, so we discussed the um, matzahs, we discussed wine. Um, some other strategies I want to share with you is let's have a look here. Ah. It's a very important piece at the Seder itself not to overeat. You want to enjoy your Seder as well, but if you have a weak stomach or you have heartburn, two or three people wrote in to me today uh, about heartburn and GERD, gastroesophageal reflux. And the key, uh, one of the key triggers, aside from the alcohol and the matzah, is, is overeating. So eating to 70% your full is the way to go. So you have an elegant sufficiency. You enjoy your your meal. You have the right amount of matzah, the right amount, uh, the right type of wine as well, or grape juice, whatever it's going to be. There's a good chance you will actually do very, very well. Another tip is to hydrate very, very well at two junctions. The first is part of this pre-Pesach, where you are, not, where we all are now until Pesach is ensure all the lifestyle things we spoke about, but also making sure to hydrate well. And the rule of thumb is half an ounce to an ounce of water per pound of body weight. So if you're 65 kilograms, you can do the math, it's about two and a half liters of water a day. And that drinking should be done at least 20 minutes up to your meal or from 40 to 45 minutes to an hour after your meal, but not excessive drinking at your meal time. So, Translate this to your Seder. 
is to drink through the Seder, drink water through the Seder, or you can have some uh, um, yeah, water or, or seltzer, though those two items are, are generally just good. You'll stay with the wine or the grape juice, whatever it's going to be, or a mix, but just have water and making sure you'll have at least one to one and a half cups of water after each cup of wine or, or grape juice. This way it just dilutes things in your stomach acid. The Seder, the Haggadah, uh, is stretched out somewhat, so you've got your body has time to really um, help the digestive process as well. So that's uh, um, something to bear in mind. Okay. Um, some of my patients um, get a lot of benefit from drinking chamomile, peppermint, or fennel tea. There is um, all of these three teas, specifically peppermint is very, very soothing on the mucous membranes of the stomach. So you can prepare this tea and drink that during your during your meal, during the Seder as well, between your your cups of wine instead of the water. So it's another option. And uh, what you can also do is just make a, a combination of these three teas, chamomile, peppermint, and fennel. They each do something very special within the digestive system, reducing gas, uh, soothing mucous membranes, helping with digestion, and really soothe our whole entire digestive process. So drinking one and a half cups uh, between um, between the wine and the matzahs, that's also a very good thing to do instead of the water, or in addition to the water as well. After meals, it's a really good thing if you can, not only on this, at the set of time, but go for a 15 to 20 minute walk, just a, a stroll. That really research has shown that helps peristalsis, it helps things digest through very very easily, helps move move, move, move the food from the stomach into the small intestine and, and onwards is a very helpful thing to do as well. So, okay. Any more questions coming into the chat, feel free to post them. So we discussed wine, we discussed matzo, we discussed strategies for eating. Um, I want to address a question that's come up in the chat here. Um, a few questions. Let me do that now. Um, is spelt matzah better than wheat matzah for digestion? Rifki writes in. Great question. Thank you. Again, this is a personal preference. Um, whatever works best for you. However, that being said, in my experience, I've seen people do a lot, lot better on spelt matzah than wheat for lots of different reasons. So if, if you have an option to get a thin wheat matzah, either hand or machine, if thin spelt matzah, you'll be better off than, than a wheat matzah. And once again, there's, a, there's the gluten-free oat variety. However, it's, it's not as thin and not necessarily as tasty, but then it's gluten-free. Someone has written in, I'm reversing diabetes. What do you suggest? I think I covered that with those strategies. The low alcohol wine is important because alcohol converts to sugar. So if you're losing, using low alcohol wine, there's less alcohol to convert to sugar, and also the uh, concept of diluting your grape juice where you are allowed to do that. Um, okay, someone's written in here, how to avoid eating, you know, the garbage basically, the matzah, matzah cake, matzah meal, they give me a stomach ache and digestive issues. So this is where it's important to To really have these foods out of your out of your sight as much as possible, because once you see them, it's very it's much harder to say no. So, Pesach is a wonderful opportunity to reset and eat clean. Most most people are either obey or cooking themselves. There's very little preservatives and garbage within the, the sort of the raw Pesach eating program. I'm not talking about snacks and things like that. It's an opportunity to clean eating. And I just wanted to say something here. It's really a mind, I don't want to say game, but it's a mind game. It's to do with perspective. On the one hand, a person can approach this whole period of, wow, what an opportunity to eat clean, to detox my body, to reset my body, to have all these wonderful foods. And another mindset could be, Mm, I get to, uh, you know, I kind of have all the foods I want to have, you know. I'm feeling, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling, what's the word, uh, 
I'm missing out. That's why I'm missing out on all the, I'm feeling deprived of all the things I can't have. So which, which perspective are you going to have? You're going to look at it as an opportunity to eat clean and nourish and nurture your body. You're going to look at it as like, I'm missing out and, uh, you know, this is terrible. It's your choice. And uh, sorry to be so frank, but it's really true. We, this, this is a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. And this is really about changing one's approach to see it as a beautiful opportunity to clean our physical homes from those things that are holding us back, clean our emotional worlds up so we become more centered, more mindful, more, gra- more grateful as, as people. And, and in terms of food, just be able to eat clean and those other foods that are not in service of our health and well-being, you know, that's just not on the, it's not, it's not an option. Okay, so someone else has written in the chat, what to do if grape juice is a laxative for me? Wow, that's a really good question. That is a really good question. I don't know if, if, if wine does that to you as well. If, if certain foods promote, uh, promote, you know, bowel mob movements, then, then maybe that's a good thing because it will offset any possible downside with too much matzah. But not all grape juices may have that effect. And if it does, then, then maybe an unpleasant, then maybe looking towards a low alcohol wine may be a better option. I don't know. Maybe try it on Shabbos before and let's see what happens to you. Great question. Thank you. Okay. Um, Let's see what else has come in. Um, okay, yeah, I just just a quest, just a note about eating in the, in this going back to our first time zone, uh, this pre Pesach time zone. When you when you're making food, people have a tendency to overtaste the food all the way long, and there's a downside. The two downsides. One is you tend to overeat. The second thing is you don't tend to sit down and have a proper meal. So two strategies to avoid overtasting is to have gum in your mouth. So you have to take that out. And the gum has its own taste, which will mess up the flavor of tasting what it is you want to eat. Anyway, or just um, take some fresh peppermint leaves, which are available, and chew those. And the act of... Having to take something out of your mouth will may make you think twice because really you just need to taste the food once and you're good to go and move on. So, so uh, those are some pre taste strategies. Okay, I think I've covered the main points. I will send out, um, uh, hopefully in the next 24 hours, the pre taste health uh, guide, which is a much a more involved um, strategies than some of the ones I've shared here today. But either way, they're going to bring you um, some answers and some strategies to help this Pesach be the best Pesach ever. So I just want to thank you, each each of you, once again, for joining me on Mind Body Monday, because Mind Body Monday is all about self-care being the heart of health care. All you need to do is take one small step in the direction of health and healing in mind body and soul and I look forward to seeing you on the next Mind Body Monday which will be I think on the 27th of um, of April so I'm going to open the uh, mics this way if you have a question about something I've covered or a question about something I haven't covered on the topic you're able to do that so you can either raise your physical hand or raise your digital hand and this way I could see you in the chat Okay, I'm going to ask you to say your name, please, and where are you zooming in from? Right, Deborah, you go ahead and mute your name and where are you zooming in from? I'm zooming from Riverdale, New York. Welcome, it's lovely to have you here, Deborah. Yes, thank you very much for everything you're sharing. It's my pleasure. Did you, did you have a question or a comment on anything, Deborah? No, I'm looking forward to your guidelines, um, especially about for people that have type 2 diabetes and, um, and indigestion, constipation, <laughs> all of that. Okay, Thanks. 
Great. I'm really, really happy you're here. The guidelines will speak to some of those uh, concerns. Um, however, some of the strategies that are shared today and understanding that there are these four specific time zones and really taking care of yourself in these four time zones, I think is just very organizing and helps you to hydrate and get your sleep and do all the things you need to do to take care of yourself physically, emotionally and mentally as you as we move up towards the sailor. Great. Thanks, Deborah. Lovely having you here. Anybody else with a question, either raise your physical hand or your digital hand and I can answer your question, or if you just want to post in the chat, that's okay too. Okay. So once again, if there are no more questions, I just want to say to each one of you, thank you so much for taking time in on a Monday. If it's morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are in the world, well done. It because, because it means that you putting your health and your needs on the map. And I, I'm reminded of the analogy, and it's, it's, a, it's not only an analogy, but it's a, it's, it's a life-saving uh, point, is we've all flown on aeroplanes and we've all heard, if there's a loss of cabin pressure, that the mother has to take the oxygen over her mask, over her face, before the infant. And at first thought you can think that's so cruel you know why are you doing that but we all know that for the mother to be a mom she has to be taken care of and whether that is her own oxygen in terms of having a sleep or have sit down to eat or you know kids are all over her or grandchildren and you just say you know Emma needs some space now stand back three feet you know just give me my space that's Whatever the oxygen, however the oxygen shows up in your life, it's so important to take that because it's not an act of selfishness. It's an act of selflessness because you're doing it in service of your loved ones. You're doing it in service of your family. And there's something so dear about that because Chazal teach in the merit of the woman, Klal Yisrael were freed from its rhyme. And that's not a historical statement. It's an ongoing spiritual truth. And it starts with women taking back and stepping into their greatness as they do, as you do, and just take your oxygen and give yourself permission to really give yourself so you can be at the best for yourself and for everybody you, you call to serve as well. Any other questions before I sign off and see you next next. Uh, Someone's written a Chakash of Thank you so much, Doc Avram. I appreciate Esther. Lovely having you here. So I want to wish you all a Chakash of and I look forward to seeing you in Mind Body Monday after the Chag. Stay tuned because I'm sending out a week's worth of strategies and tips that I find helpful in my mind, in my life. Some of those are physical, some of those emotional, some of those are spiritual. All things is to help us be at our best. And then the Pesach God will be coming in a day or two. All the best. Hugs and